is public ground, a common, and should remain forever open, clear, and free of any building or obstruction, whatever. That was just a statement. It wasn't a law. But he invoked that statement and took the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, to court over a period of about 20 years, uh, from 1890 to about 1910, in order to protect that land from private exploitation. And he won. He was vilified, but he nevertheless won. And today that principle remains a very strong one in Chicago. So if you go up and down Lakeshore Drive, some 20 miles of it, you will see largely parks, rias, beaches, playgrounds, golf course, and so forth. Not, not huge private buildings. Oh, Uh, as you look at it here, it's very narrow, isn't it? It's been channeled with steel uh, sides to it for the most part. It's uh, not very deep, about 18 feet on average, I think. It winds a lot. It's pretty sluggish. The other ugly thing I can say about the Chicago River, in the 19th century, it was a sewer. I mean, people dumped their human, animal, and industrial waste into the nearest waterway, and in the case of Chicago, it was the Chicago River. Now, our fresh drinking water came from Lake Michigan, but in times of torrential downpours, the Chicago River would rise and flow further out into Lake Michigan, contaminating the intake pipes. And there was a lot of waterborne disease. Uh, people didn't understand that exactly, but they knew they did not like to drink sewer water. So the decision was made to reverse the flow of the river. Instead of its flowing eastward into Lake Michigan, have it flow westward away from Lake Michigan. A huge project ensued the construction of the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. It's a 28 mile long trench in the south branch of the river, deeper than the river. So when they opened the sluice gates in uh, January of 1900, the water from the river simply started to flow backward, drawn to its own level in this deep sanitary and ship canal, thereby reversing the river, quite a feat. Now, we're passing under a bridge here. Uh, it's not in use anymore. It's an old railroad bridge. But it is a trunnion bascule bridge. You could see some ugly yellow counterweights on either side of the bridge. As we pass, there's one here on the south side. The way these work, the trunnion is the axle around which the gears turn. And then the counterweights sink into the ground. And the span, or the length of the bridge, rises very smoothly. That's the way all of our bridges uh, here in Chicago work. Uh, the ones that we've been going under are movable, and they need to rise on a schedule to enable tall masted sailboats uh, to go under them. Trunnion bascule. Bascule is the French word for seesaw. OK, we're back to the confluence of the river here, the junction of the north and south branches with the main branch. Beautiful view of the city. Um, look ahead of you. You see the Willis Tower with the communication antenna on top and you'll get a better view of it when we get beyond it and then are coming back up the river. Uh, but in front of it, you see, glowing in the sun, a pyramid top to the uh, Chicago Opera House, the Civic Opera Building. And look around, there's another pyramid sort of buried amongst the skyscrapers here. And if you look farther to your left, you'll see these pyramid-like tops on a number of buildings. These are architects not imitating each other, but bringing some visual harmony among the architectural styles over uh, many years of time. A uh, subtle but a way of harmonizing the buildings, uh, uh, certainly in this part of the city. Now over the yellow train trestle in front of you uh, is a blue tinted building with stainless steel uh, bullnose mullions running along the side of it. It's a third design by that firm Cone, Pedersen, and Fox, the ones who designed the green glass building on its left. And uh, the blue tinted building dates from 2002. This goes by its street address, 191 North Wacker Drive. As we pass under the Lake uh, Street Bridge, look to your left and you'll see a little red brick building that's an example of the first Chicago School of Architectural Style. from 1910 by architects Hollibird and Roche. 
In your mind's eye, take off the ivy, the modern glass, the brick, and what you would have would be a metal frame, a lattice work frame. This is what is holding up the building. And the early Chicago architects in the 1880s, 1890s, developed this style in order to allow buildings to be skyscrapers, 15 and 18 stories tall. Uh, heretofore, they've been masonry, load-bearing walls, great big thick walls, consuming a lot of the interior space of the building. But once that metal frame was developed, then you could just hang a facade of brick or limestone or granite and glass on the facade and enable the building to be a whole lot taller. hear bells going off, sometimes that means they're getting ready to raise the bridges. The building on your left, um, just beyond the bridge, is a 1958 design, and you're just thinking, why would she point this out? It's not very pretty. But we don't have too many of the buildings from that era remaining in Chicago. Uh, this one was designed by Graham Anderson Probst and White. Uh, General Growth Properties occupies it. They manage big shopping centers all over the world. Um, here we have spandrels. Those are those elements above one window, below the other. Uh, they're out of stainless steel and fluted. So they enliven what otherwise would be a rather solemn uh, facade to this 1958 building. The same architectural firm designed the Civic Opera Building, which comes up next on your left, but it's about 30 years earlier, 1929. Huge, huge building. Uh, the massing of the building is in the Art Deco style. It resembles a giant throne with the back of the throne facing Wacker Drive and the lower uh, wings or arms of this throne facing us. Also by Graham Anderson, Post and White. Look at the ornamentation above the name of the building, Civic Opera Building. Can you see the masks of tragedy and comedy? The masks of tragedy and comedy, can you see those? And then beneath them, a musical instrument, the lyre. Often Art Deco artistic styling would hint at what goes on inside the building. In this case, musical drama, the opera. Alas, the building opened just six days after the great stock market crash in October of 1929, and all of the investors lost their money, and the opera went bankrupt. That's kind of ironic, because now the uh, Chicago Lyric Opera is one of the most successful in the world, both financially and artistically. It's also got one of the most beautiful interior spaces in Chicago, if you can ever go inside. Looking to your left, this is a more modern building from 1987, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Center. You see what were the trading floors in the center there behind the glass uh, with two 40-story towers cantilevered out over the trading floors. Uh, the architects were Fujikawa Johnson and Associates. Now, the Mercantile Exchange has merged with the Chicago Board of Trade, so the trading floors are now the ones at the Chicago Board of Trade, and they've retrofitted that central area behind the glass uh, for other purposes. If you turn to your right, let's talk about modernism. The building that we've just about passed is the first of four large buildings comprising the Gateway Center, meaning the gateway to the western side of the city. There are four large buildings along here, all designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Mary.